Welcome everybody. At the annual general meeting of Fastnet, I would like to uh, welcome you. Because of the corona situation, uh, this meeting will be online and later on you can always review it and it's available for everybody. Uh, my name is Bart Lubbers, I'm the chairman of the supervisory board of Fastnet and I will lead you through this meeting. This meeting is publicly accessible for uh, depository receipt holders and they have been given the opportunity to vote and also to submit questions which we will come later to. Before moving to the next item on the agenda I will first show you the disclaimer. Subsequently is today's agenda. Uh, there have been no requests uh, for changes on the agenda so this will be the agenda for today. As you can see, we have two meetings today. Uh, before the break, I will chair the general meeting of shareholders. And after the break, Hieke Spoelstra will chair uh, the meeting of the depository receipt holders. Why do we have two meetings? It is because of our governance structure. The structure is as follows. Uh, Fastnet has only one shareholder, which our, is our foundation. Therefore, the Fast Foundation has the voting rights and it protects our mission. For every share, the FAST Foundation issues a depository receipt. Uh, the depository receipts are owned by the investors. All investors, including the founders uh, of FASTnet, uh, have the same kind of depository receipts. There is no difference. Um, as the FAST Foundation is the sole shareholder of FASTnet, uh, today I will ask several times at the chair of the foundation uh, to make decisions on certain issues. She will then agree or not agree uh, on behalf of the board of the FAST Foundation. Uh, just to be clear, uh, when I talk about the FAST Foundation, the FAST board or its chair, uh, in the end it's always our shareholder. Based on our governance structure, uh, we have three boards. As you can see here on the slide, on the left side we have the board of directors, which consists of Michiel Langezaal, Niels Kortes Alders and Victor van Dijk. Uh, we have the supervisory board. Marike Baks, Marije van Mens, Hans Michels and myself. And then we have the boards of our FAST Foundation, Sieke Spoelstra, Fiona Burema and Henk Paas. On the agenda today is also uh, the welcoming of two new, new candidates to the board of the FAST Foundation, Maaike Veen and Lieselotte Kooi. And last but not least, I would like to welcome our accountant, Jasper de Bruin of Deloitte. For the management report, which is on the next item on the agenda, I will give the word to our CEO, Michiel Langezaal. Michiel, go ahead. Thank you, Bart. And also a warm welcome from my side. I would like to start our review of 2020 with an answer on why. Why am I here? Why we are investing in this company? and why that is a good idea. Fastnet was founded to build the fast charging infrastructure that is needed to allow people to start driving electric cars. Our mission is to give freedom to electric drivers and accelerate the transition to electric mobility. Our horizon is the milestone of reaching a thousand stations across Europe, where we sell only sustainable energy from sun and wind. That is what we work on day in, day out. Freedom means that you can drive wherever you want to go. Think about road movies. That is what driving is all about. And that freedom is the service that Fastnet sells and delivers to its customers. Why is it important to accelerate the transition to electric mobility? Climate change is one of the biggest challenges that humanity faces. And the consequences of climate change on our societies are devastating. What is at the root cause? It is the rapidly increasing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. An important part of these emissions is created by humanity driving cars with internal combustion engines. And our core business is to sell electricity to electric drivers. With every kilowatt hour sold, we displace roughly one third of a liter of fossil fuel not burning up in our atmosphere. 
In 2020, we report a total of almost 9,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions avoided. And with the number of electric vehicles on the road and therefore the charging demand growing exponentially, the amount of carbon dioxide emissions avoided by charging stations will grow exponentially as well. Bart and I founded Fastnet with the aim to solve the chicken and egg problem of electric cars versus charging infrastructure in order to enable people to start driving electric cars and contribute to the battle against climate change. We built stations like this, large stations with many very high power chargers along motorways. And we do that for two reasons. One, imagine being an electric driver. You drive along the motorway and your battery starts to run empty. What do you prefer when you have the option? You drive to a petrol station that installed a charger or two at the back of its shop and installed these as part of the storyline where managing the energy transition. Or do you go to a large drive-through station like this one with many chargers, so there's always one free to use, operated by a party that wants to accelerate the transition to electric mobility and therefore does the utmost to provide the very best customer experience and uptime. Two, the charging infrastructure we built today is developed with the outlook of a charging market of millions of electric cars on our roads in several years from now. It is our mission to accelerate this adoption rate and we do this by building charging infrastructure which is the key enabler for people to make the switch to driving electric. This is why we build stations that are scalable, that have large grid connections and can serve hundreds of customers a day. Our view on the market is that we are still at day one. And yes, I borrowed that term from Jeff Bezos from Amazon. Day one of an exponentially growing and massive charging market. Just think about it. Today, 1% of cars in our markets are electric, and most governments in these countries plan to phase out the sales of cars with internal combustion engines by around 2030. And Bloomberg New Energy Finance expects that by 2025, electric vehicles will outperform cars with internal combustion engines in every way. The consequence of this is that it's very likely that by 2030, nearly all car sales will be fully electric. And from that moment onwards, it will take roughly two decades before the entire car stock on our roads becomes electric. This is why the charging market will be a growth market for decades to come, serving millions of cars going electric. Just think about the size of the petrol market today and think of this being electric in a few decades from now. In 2020, we continued to make steady progress towards our goals. We grew our revenues by 37%, even though people drove far less than they used to. Also, we've been lucky. Other entrepreneurs have been hit much harder by the corona pandemic and the ensuing restrictions than Fastnet. Despite corona, the number of electric cars on the road continued to grow. And as a consequence, early this year, we came to the point where we delivered more kilowatt hour, despite everybody being in lockdown, compared to February 2020, when everybody was moving around. Just think about what will start happening when we take the corona breaks off in the coming months. In 2020, we achieved many great things, of which I'd like to highlight some to you. Last year, we've again increased our efforts on advocating for public competitive tenders, in which we have become a European expert on the back of our very early start in the front runner market. This effort was well worth it. Our message on competitive tenders to let the best party develop infrastructure is well received by governments across Europe. A lack of competition can lead to poor quality. We see that, for example, in France, where Isivia was forced to shut down almost 200 chargers along the French motorway last year due to quality issues with construction, maintenance and network operations. This infrastructure was built by the French electricity company EDF without a competitive process. Twitter was full of electric drivers complaining and asking how this could have happened. 
This event provides fertile ground to convey the message of competitive procedures for the construction and operation of fast charging stations, leading to the development of high quality charging infrastructure for electric drivers. Similarly, we make great steps in Germany. We've been showing the government that they can play a crucial role in providing market access by offering new charging station locations to the market. In addition to providing subsidies to accelerating the construction of charging infrastructure. The potential inclusion of new highway locations in the upcoming charging infrastructure tender is a great example of this. Next to advocating for tenders with the right conditions to invest and accelerate the rollout of charging infrastructure, we're also winning tenders. A great example is the nine locations on the French Apé de Zer motorway network, which we won late last year. These locations will form the start of the Fastnet network in France that will go live later this year. A step forward and something our French team and especially Pierre Bourgillon as our first team member in the country can be incredibly proud of. Today, this team is working hard to respond to tenders from Sanef, Vancy, and Apé de Zer in order to grow our pipeline of locations and expand our network in France. Things from which we expect great results later this year or early 2022. Also, I'm incredibly proud of the progress we've made with our supply base. In challenging circumstances, we've built 17 new stations, which maybe doesn't sound super exciting, but there's important stuff happening under the hood. We've built our first stations in Switzerland and Belgium, adding two more countries to our network. But more importantly, we've made big steps in these countries with setting up an office, team and supplier base to build these stations. This allows us to scale and build many more stations in these countries in the coming years. That is what I meant with what is happening under the hood. In 2020, we launched Revolt, our purpose-built software platform, which provides the basis for a flawless charging experience. This development was the result of several years of long hours by a team of software engineers and tons of experience derived from our early start in a front runner market. Revolt now forms the heart of our operations and allows us to tailor the software to our specific customer and operational needs. Also, we have full control over the development of functionality, which is in our view key in a rapidly developing market and in providing a seamless charging experience to our customers. Revolt is designed to scale with the expected growth in charging volumes. With the current setup, we're able to ensure smooth operation of thousands of charging stations. We see our strong operations as an opportunity to bring superior value to our customers. And I'm proud of the reliability of our network and the steps we took in making charging at Fastnet as easy as possible. First of all, we're actively making sure that Fastnet remains to be one of the most reliable charging networks in Europe. Our 99.9% .9 uptime is enabled by Revolt and the continuous improvement processes we put in place. A good example of how we keep pushing the envelope to do even better, are advanced analytics to spot charger issues. This allows us to detect and solve potential issues before our customers take notice. These capabilities are unique to Fastnet and in our view are crucial to be able to grow rapidly in an exponentially growing market. Secondly, we should not forget that the EV market is still very, very young. For many people in the coming years, charging an electric vehicle will be something they do for the first time. That is why we're super focused on making that charging experience as easy as possible. We do this in multiple ways. One, we try to offer a wide range of payment methods to make the process of payment as easy as possible. Two, we have custom charger screens to communicate more effectively with our customers and coach them 
through that charging process as swiftly as possible. Three, at the same time, we meticulously track charging sessions to understand what goes wrong and improve the customer journey based on that information. If our customers still have questions, we want to be there for them. And that is why we're available 24 seven in all local languages. We, we pride ourselves to pick up the phone within 10 seconds on average and reply to emails in under two and a half hours. Also, we track all reasons customers contact us for and actively use this feedback to improve our digital and physical product. To give an example, during winter, we get significantly more complaints about low charging speed. We now proactively inform customers about the impact of outside temperature on the charging speed. This is a consequence of a colder battery. Furthermore, we share this feedback with car makers to encourage them to enable a battery preheating function in their next generation of vehicles. Then lastly, before I hand you over to Victor van Dijk, our CFO, to discuss the financial results of 2020, I would like to mention the big news about our equity raise of 150 million euro in February of this year. First of all, a result of which Victor can be incredibly proud of. Next to that, this capital raise is a true game changer for Fastnet. It allows us to step up our game from an important role we played in the chicken and egg situation of electric cars versus charging infrastructure in the Netherlands. But with this funding, we can now take a leading role in building charging infrastructure in Europe. On that note, I would like to hand you over now to Victor van Dijk, our CFO, to take you through the financial results of 2020. Thank you, Michiel. I'll take you through our 2020 financials. Fastnet sales grew considerably in 2020 by 37%, but were of course affected by COVID related lockdowns. Fastnet sales are normally driven by the number of electric vehicles on the road, which you can see in the graph. With the number of electric vehicles on the road in the Netherlands in green and Fastnet revenue from electricity sales in yellow. You can clearly see that pre COVID, Revenues were fully driven by the number of electric vehicles. What you can also clearly see is that since COVID, this correlation has changed strongly, which makes sense. A lot of people work from home and therefore also have less charging needs. Sales dropped by 70% in March due to the first lockdowns across Europe. Sales recovered somewhat since, but are still below potential in our view due to the continued lockdowns. Because the number of electric vehicles is still growing very, very strongly, we expect that when lockdown measures are fully lifted, our revenues will recover strongly. A question we ask ourselves is, can we quantify the effect of lockdowns on sales? In reality, that is very hard to do because there are many other factors that could impact sales. We can make a comparison to sales parameters over the last years though, to show what impact we have seen. In this graph, we show the number of kilowatt hours that Fastnet sold in the Netherlands versus the number of electric vehicles registered in the Netherlands, which is, as explained, the key driver of sales. This parameter has been growing consistently during our existence due to fast charging becoming a larger part of the charging mix for electric vehicle drivers and due to our number of stations growing. Since the lockdowns, this metric has clearly reduced versus the years before. If we would have had the same amount of kilowatt hours sold per electric vehicle in Q1 this year as in Q1 2019, Q1 2021 sales would have been more than 60% higher. For Q2 2020 to Q4 2020, we saw similar or even higher numbers. As said, it is not possible to quantify how much of the reduction in sales is attributable to the lockdown measures or to other factors. But we do expect that this is at least for a large part due to the lockdown measures. Therefore, we expect sales to recover strongly when lockdown measures are finally lifted and expect that going forward, electric vehicle growth will remain the main driver of sales growth. So what is the potential when we have more critical mass in electric vehicles on the road? 
The Dutch government actually looked into the expected charging demands on its highway network for planning purposes and asked research agency TNO to estimate charging demands by 2030 across the 245 Dutch highway service areas. TNO took the Dutch target of 20% EV adoption by 2030 as an input. So one in five cars on the road being fully electric by the end of the decade. They further assumed that those cars would do 10% of their total charging needs on the highway network, up from 5% now, due to newer adopters having less ability to charge at home. That 5% is in line with our numbers and has been growing indeed. The 10% might actually be low. Boston Consulting Group, in a recent publication, puts highway charging at 23% of total charging by 2030. With that, TNO calculated a charge demand of more than 200,000 kWh per month, on average, across the 245 Dutch highway locations. That is almost 20 times more than we supplied per station just pre-corona. The 20 times makes sense. With the number of electric vehicles 10 to 20 folding and highway charging 2 folding, you can expect an increase in the tune of 20 times. TNO also calculates the number of charges needed, with a time-based utilization of 20% and the average charge speed increasing to 120 kilowatts, they get to 12 charges on average across the 245 locations. That is three to four times more than we had just pre-corona. So you don't need 20 times more charges, but a lot less due to charge speeds increasing. This will help the business case, of course. Note that the busiest locations are expected to require more than 40 charges. Overall, charging stations on highway service areas will need to become significantly larger than the petrol stations on the same locations. That makes sense, because the energy or kilometer range you put into the car per minute is still much higher for petrol than for electricity. So you need more charges than pumps. With this, our station metrics will change strongly. Revenue is obviously driven by kilowatt hours sold. With a 20 times increase, we expect revenues to increase significantly to more than 1 million euro per station, from the 70,000 euro we saw just pre-corona. Operating costs and investments will grow more in line with the number of charges, so it should grow three to four fold. This shows that faster charging is better for the business case. Combining this, we obviously get to very attractive returns. Note that these are not industry figures, but fastnet figures. To be able to make these returns, you need to have everything right. Very high traffic, like on these highway locations. Dedicated and large drive-through fast charging stations that you can run at a high utilization. And large stations are also more capex efficient, so will drive returns. The competitive position for large stations at high traffic highway locations is simply much better than for smaller stations at lower traffic locations, just like for petrol stations. Also note that by 2030, Fastnet should have close to 200 stations operational on these highway locations in the Netherlands. And we have a target for a thousand stations across Europe. With the potential per station as just discussed, obviously our P&L should look quite different from today. So looking at today's P&L on the next slide. As mentioned, revenues related to charging grew by 37% in 2020, despite Corona measures reducing sales growth. Network operation costs increased, but network operation costs per charger, the more relevant metric, decreased slightly. Operational EBITDA per station and overall was up more than the respective revenue numbers evidencing the intrinsic operational leverage we have in our business model. Network expansion costs increased as we are gearing up the organization for increased growth in network development. In February 2021, Fastnet raised 150 million in equity. This increased book equity to 123 million positive and a cash level to 175 million pro forma year end 2020. This will allow us to grow from a market leader in the Netherlands to a major player in Europe, as explained by Michiel. Underlying net profit was still negative, at minus 12.4 million euros, as planned at the current phase of EV adoption. 
I'll hand it over to Michiel for the outlook. Thank you, Victor. Now let me take you along and see what's ahead for Fastnet. As just mentioned, the 150 million equity raise in February has really allowed Fastnet to release the brakes and get into the highest gear. On the other hand, I want to manage expectations as well. You won't see an increased number of stations popping out of the ground immediately. Building stations is not like going to the supermarket and just taking the product off the shelf. There is significant inertia in the process of building these stations, which is why it's so incredibly important that Fastnet realized this funding at this moment in time, leaving a huge barrier to entry behind us. We've made many steps in previous years and we are currently investing in a construction supply chain of an even larger scale throughout an even bigger part of Europe. And yes, there are parties taking shortcuts to put dots on a map faster. They settle for smaller sites at less attractive locations under less attractive terms and with low utilization potential as a consequence of being a small site. As Victor just explained, the return of investment on our stations is for a very large part dependent on the CapEx investment in those stations. Fastnet is unique by being the main contractor ourselves, and in doing so, building at significantly lower cost. This will lead to an important competitive advantage in the long run. In addition to the scaling of our construction supply chain, we are growing the entire team in order to get to the goal of a thousand Fastnet stations even faster. We are growing our network development team to accelerate the growth of our location pipeline. We're investing heavily in our design team to be able to reply to the large number of tenders for new sites that all have to be designed in the coming years. We are growing our operations, software and data teams to learn faster and improve processes quicker. As a result, we expect to double the organization in the next 12 to 24 months. With the EV market continuing to grow, just think about the potential yet to be tapped in this market. EV sales are growing in all our markets. With the Netherlands, our stronghold having a very strong lead. This allows us to be at the forefront of innovation. And let's not forget, this is sales figures we're looking at. For the, charge, for the charging market, today is still day one with just around 1% of cars in our markets being electric and a full transition ahead of us. There are five drivers, all accelerating electric vehicle growth. One, government policies and support. Two, an increasing supply of vehicles. Three, better batteries. Four, growing consumer preference. And of course, better, and faster charging infrastructure like ours. Let's dig a bit deeper. Let me talk about the first one, government policies and support. European fleet CO2 emission caps are becoming stricter and stricter year on year. And most governments plan to phase out combustion engines by around 2030, with the impact that all new car sales by that time will be electric. About support, take a look at the European Green Deal, for example, which has the goal of 1 million publicly accessible chargers installed by 2025, or the close to 700 billion post-corona recovery plan of the European Union, in which recharging is one of the seven flagships targeted. The supply of electric vehicles keeps increasing. Car manufacturers are ramping up production capacity of electric vehicles to comply with the regulations and to react to competitive pressure. The number of fully electric models on the European market doubled from 23 in 2019 to 57 in 2021. An impressive example comes from Volkswagen. They're putting new electric vehicles on the road in huge numbers based on the MEV platform. And also think about the construction of factories for these electric vehicles, with, for example, the new Gigafactory in Berlin, 
These things are not built for a handful of cars. They are there to deliver massive quantities of cars to our markets. On top of that, battery technology keeps advancing. In 2020, battery prices below $100 per kilowatt hour were reported for the first time. Bloomberg New Energy Finance forecast purchase price parity between electric cars and those with internal combustion engines by 2025. Furthermore, in the battery day presentation by Tesla late last year, they announced their new goal of pushing battery prices down to $50 per kilowatt hour and a step-by-step -step plan to get there. A well-recommended YouTube video, by the way, to have a look at. And of course, more importantly, people start to embrace electric vehicles. The top three best sold cars in the Netherlands in 2020 were all electric vehicles. And last but not least, I'm glad to say that we keep contributing to the last driver out there. Better charging infrastructure and faster charging. Time again and again, surveys reveal that charging infrastructure and charging time and the reliability of those networks are key bottlenecks for people to go electric. It's our mission to get these issues out of the way. After discussing the drivers behind the number of electric cars on the road, I want to spend a little time on the drivers for the charging market. An average car drives, let's say 20,000 kilometers per annum, and therefore needs around 4,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. These three modes together deliver that energy. And as a consequence, the percentage of fast charging in the mix is an important driver for our business. Initially, the majority of the charging volume was provided by home charging and street charging. As fast charging was still slow, and there was still ample charging capacity available by other modes. But over time, we see this changing as a consequence of the rapidly increasing charging speed and the growing battery sizes and charging capacity of the infrastructure that is available. This is also seen by parties modeling future charging behavior, such as TNO, McKinsey and the Boston Consulting Group. The latter being the most extreme in its expectations with an outlook of around a third of the charging volume to be fast charging at the end of the decade versus around 5% today. In our view, the availability of very fast charging technology is core to enabling people to go electric, including those without a driveway. And cars such as this Ionic by Hyundai are a great example of what is happening. From a Nissan Leaf with sub 50 kilowatt charging in 2012 to 170 five kilowatt of sustained charging power being in the dealership today from a mid-market brand as Hyundai, that is astonishing. Although it isn't exactly resembling Moore's law for the number of transistors on a computer chip, it has to be said that this is an amazing pace of innovation. That is technology enabling change, empowering the transition. This allows people to go electric despite having access to home charging and enabling an even better user experience with faster stopovers. Just imagine the difference of freedom this vehicle provides. A weekly 15 minute stopover at a charging station is roughly what the average motorist needs in terms of kilometers for its weekly driving habits. The number of electric cars on the road is rising exponentially as a consequence of more and more models being offered and more and larger factories coming online and models going into production being for larger volumes than before. On top of that, the volume share of the charging market that is expected to be delivered by fast charging is growing as well. Therefore, we better build our company to be highly scalable. This is why we build our network to allow capacity to scale on three axes simultaneously. First, growing the number of stations. Secondly, increasing the number of chargers on those locations as demand develops. And thirdly, by adding faster chargers. The result 
is an X to the power of three capacity increase, which is quite unique for Fastnet. We can make these investments in highly scalable stations because we enter into long-term land leases that allow for a long-term mindset, resulting in investments in large grid connections and the roof to make our stations highly visible. This is how we're planning for a future of millions of electric cars and then some more. And with this statement, I'd like to end the 2020 management report and hand the word back to Bart. And the next item on the agenda is the report of the supervisory board. Uh, it was the second year for the supervisory board and it was really a special year. Um, Fastnet has been upscaling a lot and raised a lot of funds uh, to make this possible. We also saw, saw new countries like France and uh, we had a good cooperation with the board of directors and the board of the Faust Foundation. Well, a more extended uh, summary of all the activities of the supervisory board you can read in the annual report. The next item on the agenda is the remuneration. And for this item, I would like to give the word to uh, my colleague, Maria van Mens, who is a member of the supervisory board, but also the chair of the remuneration committee. Thanks, Bart. So on the remuneration of the board of directors and of the supervisory board, to start with the remuneration of the board of directors, to give a bit of background, it consists of a fixed part, a variable short-term part, a variable long-term part, a pension plan and other benefits. And for 2020, the fixed part, variable long-term part, pension plan and other benefits were unchanged and within the limits of the remuneration policy. Um, for 2020, with COVID-19 impacting Fastnet's financial flexibility, it was decided not to award a variable payment. Then, the remuneration of the supervisory board, that consists of a fixed part and on a variable part based on time spent. And for 2020, the uh, remuneration of the supervisory board was unchanged. And also the remuneration of the supervisory board for 2021 shall not change in comparison to 2020. And then if you are looking for more details on remuneration, they can be found in the annual report. Thank you. At this point in the agenda, we have room for questions. And therefore, I would like to give the word to Hugo Fink. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hugo Fink. One of my roles at Fastnet is Investor Relations. We have received some questions uh, from investors in the past couple of weeks, and I'd like to ask these questions to the board. The first question is to you, uh, Niels. We see a lot more traffic on the road in the Netherlands. Do you also see this in your sales numbers? We do see traffic increasing uh, bit by bit. So it is happening, and not only in the Netherlands, but uh, actually in other countries as well. But actually, uh, a lot of the people driving electric vehicles uh, tend to be lease car drivers and they are mostly office workers so they are still working quite a bit uh, from the comfort of their home uh, so not driving around. So in terms of uh, electric vehicle kilometers uh, we haven't seen a huge increase yet. Uh, that said we are seeing uh, corona measures being relieved now and, and we can definitely expect more I believe in the next few weeks and months. Uh, and we already see a bit of that, or actually more of that happening in the UK, which is a couple of weeks ahead of mainland Europe, where we really do see uh, volumes picking up. So I think that's a, a nice signal uh, of things to happen in, uh, in the rest of our network. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is also for you. Uh, are you working with OEMs to have Fastnet, the Fastnet network integrated in new cars? Definitely. And with integration, I assume that the person asking this question would mean navigation. And we are definitely working on getting navigation into the cars. We do that by sharing our POI data, that is the location of our stations with various parties that also feed into the navigation systems of these cars. Um, and uh, apart from locations, more and more, this is also dynamic data showing if a charger is occupied or not, so that people can see in advance if, they, if charges are available. And then the next step is actually including that in a route navigation so people can drive longer distances and the navigation system tells them where to charge. Uh, so steps are being made by Tesla, by Google, uh, other parties to include it in the cars. That is one side on navigation. Other 
point of integration is uh, auto charge, where people can just plug in and charge their, then the car starts charging and, and we can build them automatically. That requires a unique uh, MAC address, which is something that not all uh, OEMs currently actually uh, provide. And it's something we're in discussions with them, uh, so we can uh, maintain auto charge also into the future. Thank you, Niels. Uh, Michiel, the next question is for you. How many stations are in construction at the moment? And how many stations will you open this year? Uh, we have today around 10 stations under construction and we expect to build more than 40 stations in the coming year, in uh, 2021. Uh, we're also adding a lot of chargers. Uh, in total, we expect to add around 200 chargers to existing stations. So end of the year, we expect the network to be sort of beyond 170 stations and more than 800 chargers installed. And we're gearing up in the entire organization and our supply chain to build even more stations in the years thereafter. So really sort of scaling that up um, to make sure that we accelerate the build pace. Sounds good. And in what country will you open the most stations this year? I think the effort is across Europe. So we're, we're adding stations in Belgium, the UK, Germany, but especially as well the Netherlands. Uh, if we look at um, yeah, the expectancy on the amount of charging capacity needed and, and what we expect from the market after the corona measures being sort of uh, eased up. I think this is really a country to invest in. Uh, but also, if we look at it percentage-wise, uh, we should look at France. Uh, we're building there the first location that we recently won with the AP de Zer tender. Um, and yeah, that will really be from zero to one. So we'll, we'll be building the first stations there and being setting up the, the FASA network in France. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Victor. One question for you. Uh, in the beginning of this year, Fastnet has raised 150 million. And the question is, uh, why didn't you inform the R holders in advance of the 150 million uh, transaction? I think it's in general difficult to uh, inform the, uh, the R holders um, ahead of the transaction because that likely would have a, a big impact on the share price. And, and that could have a negative impact on the transaction. And successful transaction is in the interest of all the stakeholders. And so for that reason, we chose not to inform investors on beforehand. And that's also something uh, that you see generally in the market that, that investors aren't uh, informed on beforehand. Okay, thank you, very clear. Why don't you use the 150 million to repay the bonds? When we did the transaction, we clearly indicated to investors, uh, we're going to use uh, these funds to um, uh, yeah, acquire new locations and, and build stations. Uh, and that's what we want to do. We want Fastnet uh, to grow a portfolio of locations and also build new stations. And that is still the intention. So I think investors would be disappointed if we uh, repay that from it instead of using it to grow uh, the business. Uh, thank you, Victor. Uh, Michiel, the next question is for you. Uh, Fastnet announced that the uh, uh, organization will be doubled uh, with the proceeds of the capital raise. Uh, what part of Fastnet will see the largest growth in employees? Yeah, so the capital raise was aimed at growing Fastnet, at growing the network, building more stations and, and, and growing the company as a whole. Uh, and that's what we're using that money for as well. So we're growing the team of public affairs, uh, advocating for, for public competitive tenders, we're growing the team of network development, working on tenders, uh, growing the pipeline of locations. Uh, we're growing our team of designing the locations to, to make sure that the designs work and that those locations are there, that the building plants are there. And we're growing the team that builds those stations, that works with suppliers in the supply chain to make sure that, that we can build what we acquire. Um, and lastly, um, yeah, when we've built that, we also want to grow the revenues on that network. So we're heavily investing in the operations team, in, in making sure that we have the data team there that, that improves the processes and makes us ready to, to continue to grow in that exponentially growing market. So we're growing across the board, but with a very big focus on network development, public affairs, growing the pipeline of locations and building more stations. Okay, thank you. The next question is also for you, and we've seen this question uh, in the past. Um, when will we see the first shops at Fastnet stations? Fastnet mission is freedom for an electric driver. So our primary focus is building infrastructure to allow people to make that switch to electric cars. And of course, coffee, sandwiches, toilets, that's a nice addition, but the core focus is that charging infrastructure. Uh, today, we see more and more locations coming up in our pipeline that don't offer these services in, in any way. So we're, we're focused on providing services first where, where basically the minimum is not 
present. Uh, an example of that is, is a location Brecht in Belgium, uh, where we um, will build a, a large charging station with a shop en route from Antwerp to Breda. Uh, and that station will really be sort of the first pilot where we have a charging station, a shop, coffee, sandwiches, the whole thing. Uh, and, and later on, we'll see to add that to locations where, yeah, let's say, the need is maybe less extreme, but we do want to provide those services. Thanks. Our next question is for you. Why did the share price drop so hard after the capital raise? And do you expect it to be above 100 this year again? Yeah, I think what we see generally in the market for EV charging stocks, uh, basically in Europe and the US, is that uh, after the all-time highs in January, February this year, yeah. that they all have decreased uh, quite strongly. Um, on average, they're 50% they're below their all-time highs. Uh, Fastnet is, is a bit better than that, uh, the, the total reduction. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's, um, it's basically attributable to the general market environment for uh, EV charging stocks. And that also explains the impact after the, uh, the capital raise. And then on the question whether it will go above 100, yeah, that's, uh, we don't comment on, on, uh, on the share price or the direction of the share price. So I can't uh, comment uh, or, or um, forecast where the share price will be. Um, uh, later this year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, another question uh, also to you, Victor, is uh, the 150 million is great, of course, uh, but when can you expe can we expect uh, a new capital raise? When we did the 150 million capital raise, we indicated that 90 million of that is uh, will be allocated to building uh, a large part of the existing pipeline of about 160 locations. Uh, and that will bring us 18 to 20 months, 24 months forward. And then 60 million of the 150 million uh, is allocated to um, CAPEX related to uh, tenders in, in France, uh, tenders in Germany and also new uh, locations. Um, and uh, on that side, if, if we are very successful in, in both France and Germany, yeah, that, that could be uh, not sufficient, that 60 million. Um, and that could lead to extra funding needs. Uh, but that would actually be a very positive thing uh, because it means we are very successful in winning new locations in those jurisdictions. The next question is also for you. Uh, when do you expect that the most expansion costs can be financed out of uh, the cash flow? Yeah, we, we see this as two separate things. So one is the, um, uh, the cash flow from open stations. Um, we see that growing throughout the decade uh, and beyond. Uh, basically driven by the number of EVs increasing at eh, 10 to 20 times um, between now and 2030. Also fast charging becoming a larger part of the, the charging mix uh, that can uh, double or triple in, throughout this decade. And also uh, us opening new stations eh, from 130 going to 1000, uh, which is our target. That will all add to the operational cash flow um, of this uh, decade and beyond. And at the same time, uh, we see that yeah, there's interesting opportunities in terms of acquiring new locations. And that comes with, uh, with the expansion costs. Uh, so people working on network development and, and also building the stations. And, and those opportunities we see um, uh, definitely now at the start of the decade and we see that as a huge value add to the business and, and to the mission. So we want to, um, to make those investments uh, right now. When these two will intersect sect each other, um, that will largely depend uh, on, on um, what opportunities we will continue to see in uh, network development. Uh, so in that sense, it's very hard to put a, uh, put a date to that. Niels. Um also, a sort of related question uh, to our revenues. Uh, are there any uh, developments in your pricing policy? Our pricing has been really stable over the years. We've adhered to 59 cents per kilowatt hours and haven't made any significant changes in that. Uh, 59 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, 35 cents per kilowatt hour based on a gold membership. And the reason that we've kept that really stable is that we really believe in price transparency. That means that people know beforehand what to expect. What actually has happened over the years is we've been adding faster charges to our stations. So 150 to 300 kilowatts is now present at, at more than half the stations and going up very rapidly. And we still adhere to the same price. So we're actually delivering more value for money over the years. And at the same time, we've seen other parties actually increasing their pricing uh, above our price point, like Ionity at 79 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, but also just this week, EMBW and Instavolt announced price increases. 
So in the end, it's a reality of market, uh, and we definitely believe that with our current pricing, uh, we, we can maintain that uh, level and, and keep adding more value within that, in the best customer service, the best availability, the most convenient locations, um, and the fastest charging speed. There's a question about uh, Mr. Green takeover. I expect this one to be for you uh, as yeah. well. Um, the acquisition uh, has been made uh, in the last year, somewhere around the same time. Uh, but so far, uh, n for the outside world, nothing really happened. Can you elaborate on that? Well, maybe a little bit of news there is that we will be um, replacing the existing charges that are there, that are still the uh, Mr. Green charges with Fastnet chargers uh, over the next, uh, or in July, mostly. Uh, but that's actually an in-between period till we can build our much bigger stations. And um, that takes a bit of time. We're in permitting phase. Uh, we also need to get these really big grid connections at locations. And that unfortunately takes, uh, takes time. So for that in-between period, we will improve the service at these locations. Uh, and as soon as we can, we will, we will build these much bigger stations, just like people expect of us. And then we already reached the final question. Are there any new tenders in France? Uh, you are working on, and if so, uh, when will locations of the tenders be awarded? I think if we look at the France situation, it's, it's really gearing up. So the ministry, let's say a month or a bit more ago, sort of said there's 360 motorway services on the private highway network, and we want to have them all equipped with charging facilities, and that needs to happen quite quickly. We want to have that done by 2023. Um, and we expect a very, very large percentage of that to be tenders. Um, the ministry is supporting that with funds, so they, they, uh, they're willing to uh, support with subsidies up to 40% of capex. So there's, the market there is really gearing up for tenders. And I think if you look at that from a historical perspective, it's also logical. Last year, Isivia, uh, the charging network in France, uh, uh, had to put offline their 200 motorway uh, chargers. Um, people were very unhappy with that, and that, that network was a consequence of an uncompetitive issue of, of, of locations. So conveying the message, building infrastructure through a competitive tender process is really what, yeah, what the market, the government, what people are, are gearing up for. So that, that is happening, and we're very happy with that. This concludes our uh, Q&A session for today, and I would like to give the word to uh, Bart. The next item on the agenda is the adoption of the financial statements. Uh, our accountant Jasper de Bruyne of Deloitte, uh, together with his team, uh, has audited the financial statements of 2020 of Fastnet. He gave an unqualified uh, opinion that the financial statements give a true and fair view of the financial position of Fastnet at uh, 31 December 2020. I would like to ask the chair of the Fast Foundation to adopt the financial statements for the year 2020. Vika. The Board of FAST has reviewed the annual report, including the annual statements in 2020, and also the feedback of the accountants. The question we had have been answered by the Board of FASTnet. Therefore, on behalf of the depository receipt holders, I hereby confirm the approval of the FASTnet annual report 2020 and the adaptation of the financial statements 2020. Then we can move on to the next item on the agenda, and that's the dividend policy. At Fastnet, we have a policy that we invest all our means in the mission of the company. Uh, therefore, we don't distribute dividends, and also because we are still in a loss-making position. Again, I would like to ask our chair if she can agree. Hike, can you agree that we don't distribute dividends? On behalf of the depositor receipt holders, I hereby confirm that the FAST board agrees not to distribute dividends. The next item uh, on the agenda is a more personal one. It's about the, the discharge of the management board and the discharge of the supervisory board. And uh, I, would, I would like to use this opportunity to thank all members of uh, the management board and the supervisory board for their work last year. Uh, you and together with the team made it possible that we could make further steps into our mission. And therefore, I would like to ask Hike if you can discharge uh, 
the members of the board of directors and the members of the supervisory board. Based on the management report and the supervisory board report, on behalf of the depository receipt holders, I hereby confirm the FAST board discharges the members of the board of directors and the supervisory board for their work last year, insofar as such work is apparent from the financial statements. And I would also like to thank everybody for their contribution in the past year. Okay. Thank you, Bart. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure. And uh, now I go to the next item on the agenda, which is appointment of the external auditor, Deloitte. As stated before, uh, Jasper Bruin of Deloitte, together with his team, uh, has audited our financial statements in 2020. And we would like to extend this relationship and the board of directors would also like to extend this relationship. And therefore, I would like to ask you, that's the next question, if you can agree with the appointment of Deloitte as our auditor for the coming year 2021. On behalf of the depositary receipt holders, I hereby confirm that the FAST board agrees to appoint Deloitte as FASTnet's auditor for 2021. The next one is a more technical one, and it's a proposal to designate the management board as the competent body to issue shares and rights to subscribe for shares up to 20%. I will read the text because it's a, quite a, a legal point. Uh, the proposal is to designate the management board of Fastnet to issue shares and rights to subscribe for shares up to 20% of the issued capital and to restrict or exclude preemptive rights accruing to shareholders in relationship to this issue of shares or rights to subscribe for shares. This is subject to the approval of the supervisory board. The proposal is for a period of 18 months for both general pur purposes, provided that the issue is in accordance with the company's mission, uh, as described in its articles of association, and for the issue of the employee option policy. And I would like to ask you if you agree, can agree on that. As a shareholder, we agree on the proposal to designate the Fastnet Management Board to issue shares and preemptive rights as discussed. At this point, there are no external questions, so I move on to the next item on the agenda which is the resignation of Marike Bax and Hans Michels. Uh, as announced last month, uh, FAST and Supervisory Board members Marike Bax and Hans Michels have decided to step down from the Supervisory Board at this general meeting. Uh, they have indicated that they can no longer combine their responsibilities uh, as Supervisory Board members uh, with competing time commitments uh, for other executive and non-executive board positions. Uh, the company's supervisory board will initiate a search process for a new candidate and intends to propose her or him to a general meeting of shareholders later this year. But now back to Marike and Hans. Uh, Marike and Hans were, of course, experienced board members and I can say that we learned a lot from them. Besides that we had pleasant conversations, not only about Fastnet, but also about life itself. Therefore, I would like to thank Marike and Hans for their contribution not only professionally, but also socially. And with that, we come to the closing of our shareholders meeting. Unfortunately, uh, I will leave this desk and leave the desk to Hike, because you will chair uh, the meeting of depository receipt holders and that we will do that after the break.
Welcome at the Depository Receipt Holder Meeting of June 3rd. I'm the chair of the FAST Foundation, Hieke Spoelstra, and I will also chair this Depository Receipt Holder Meeting today. The agenda for today is shared with you. It's the opening, the report of activities in 2020, external questions, the resignation of Fiona Boruna as a member of the FAST Foundation Board, proposal for appointment of two new members of the FAST Foundation Board, for decision-making by depositary receipt holders by vote, the proposal on the amendment of the remuneration of the FAST Foundation Board members for decision-making by the depositary receipt holders by vote, and the closing. FASTnet's mission is to accelerate the transition to sustainable mobility by providing freedom to the electric vehicle drivers. To safeguard its mission, all shares in the capital of FASTnet BV are held by the FAST Foundation, which in turn issues depositary receipts for these shares to investors. These depositary receipts embody the economic benefits of ownership of the shares of FastNet. Fast exercises the voting rights attached to the FastNet shares. Fast operates independently of FastNet and its voting policy is guided by the statutory goals of FastNet. In this way, Fast supports FastNet to successfully achieve its long-term mission. The FAST board has three members today, which is myself as the chair, Fiona Boerma and Henk Pals. Report of activities. The tasks and responsibilities of FAST are to ensure key decisions are taken in line with FASTnet's statutory goals, being realizing the mission of FASTnet, ensuring the continuity of FASTnet, representing the interest of the depositary receipt holders. In 2020, FAST held five formal board meetings, attended by the full FAST board, the chairman of the supervisory board, and part of the management board, the CEO and the CFO of FASTnet. In those meetings, the FAST board asked questions about the relevant topics, and the supervisory board or the board of directors answers those questions in a timely and completed manner. During the past year, 2020, amongst other things, the following topics were discussed. We adopted the annual statements over 2019, the discharging of the members of the management board and the members of the supervisory board, and also the dismissal and appointment of the supervisory board members. Providing a proxy for the issue of ordinary shares and to exclude its preemptive rights in the execution of its mission and option plan the execution of the issue of new depository receipts for the acquisition of the fast charging network of Mr. Green, the execution of the issue of new depository receipts to employees in accordance with the conditions of the employee stock option plan. We are pleased to report that Fastnet is executing its plans in line with its mission. In 2020, Fastnet built more fast charging stations upgraded existing ones with faster chargers, delivered more renewable electricity to more customers, acquired locations to build new stations, and hired talented new people to accelerate the transition to electric mobility. A special mention is in place for one particular milestone, post-balance sheet date, in the first quarter of 2021. Fastnet managed to secure 150 million euros in capital with a minimum of dilution to the depository receipt holders. With these funds, Fastnet can rapidly build more station in multiple countries, while the continuity of the company is further ensured. Moreover, with this capital raise, Fastnet has also further solidified its continuity. As a result of these combined actions, the interest of the depository receipt holders have been served. More details on the activities of the Fastboard Foundation in 2020 can be found in the published Fast Board Report 2020. External questions. We received two questions from our depository receipt holders. The first question is, why does Fastnet Supervisory Board need to approve the appointment of the Fast Board members? The answer is that the Supervisory Board of Fastnet approves the appointment of the new Fast members to ensure an extra independent view of the Supervisory Board members. Bart Lubbers and Michiel Langezaal are still major shareholders and could otherwise determine the composition of the FAST board themselves. The second question is, why fit these persons in the FAST board? The answer is, the choices for the two new members were driven by their different areas of expertise, which we wish to have at our FAST board. 
Lisa Lottekooi will be able to add value from a legal and corporate perspective, while Maaike Veen has a financial and journalist background, which is very relevant to properly perform our duties as sole shareholder. We believe we need both profiles and individuals to ensure the mission and vision. Resignation of Fiona Boerma as a member of the FAST Foundation Board. Fiona has decided to resign as a member of the FAST Foundation Board because she can no longer make the necessary time available in view of her other duties. On behalf of all the Positor receipt holders and also Fastnet, I would like to thank Fiona for her contribution to the company. Her thorough knowledge and commitment was very much appreciated. Thank you, Fiona. Maybe you want to say a few words to the depository receipt holders. In the past years, I've really been impressed as a FAST Foundation member by the management board and the employees of FASTnet and by their expertise and drive. And it is ultimately these people who realize the energy transition and who realize the freedom to the electric driver. And I wish everyone at Fastnet, and specifically my Fast Foundation board members, all the best in this exciting and important journey. It was a pleasure and a privilege to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. We will very much miss you also. Thank you for your contribution. Proposal for the appointment of new members of the FAST Foundation Board for decision-making by the depositary receipt holders by vote. After Fiona indicated that she wishes to resign, an application procedure took place to find a successor for Fiona. The FAST Foundation Board has selected two candidates who have been also approved by the Supervisory Board. It's preferred to appoint both candidates as per the 3rd of June for a period of four years. We temporarily expand the board from three members to four members to prepare for my resignation next year. After eight years, I will step down according to the schedule of resignation after a maximum of eight years. Onboarding two new members now supports the continuity of Fastnet and allows for the two new members to already get to know Fastnet. I would now like to ask the two new members to shortly introduce themselves and share a bit about their background with you. Maike. I'm very pleased to be here because in this very building, more or less 25 years ago, I started my career as an international journalist, financial journalist, I should say, because around 2000 it housed the uh, newsroom of the Dutch Financial Daily. Uh, I'm very honored to be uh, appointed for the Vast Foundation Board because to me it brings my personal and, and professional experience together. So now you would like to know what that is. Uh, I worked as a correspondent for Dow Jones Newswires and the Wall Street Journal, uh, covering all the blue chip companies in the Netherlands. Uh, one of the highlights was the accounting scandal at Aholt. Uh, then I moved to London, was a corporate and uh, convertible bond reporter. And then I worked for almost eight years as a UK and Ireland correspondent for Dutch media. And I got to know responsible uh, investing through a publication of the Financial Times. And that g gained my interest. So when I got back to the Netherlands, I uh, joined a foundation that was really uh, focusing on impact investing to support healthcare in Africa. And since then, I've, for the past eight years, I've worked as a fundraiser for impact ventures. And my personal um, interest is nature conservation. And um, so I support that when I uh, have time. And uh, having cycled around London for eight, nine years, uh, uh, I developed quite severe asthma. So when I got back, uh, I struggled quite some time to recover. And it was actually the year 2012 that Fastnet was founded. And I, it immediately gained my interest. And obviously, clean air on the streets is very important. Uh, so I'm very pleased to bring together my personal experience here. The other proposed candidate is Lise Lot. Lisa Lott, can I invite you to certainly introduce yourself to you? Yes. Thank you, Hike. Very nice to be here. I have a legal background. Uh, for 18 years, I uh, advised on corporate and financial laws and regulations. Previously, I was a lawyer at uh, the Brouw Blackstone Westbrook, a law firm in Amsterdam. And I also worked at law firms in uh, New York and uh, other law firms in Amsterdam. I advise many different uh, types of clients, uh, multinationals, banks, financial institutions, but also private investors 
on several corporate matters, uh, transactions, M&A, but also setting up structures like for Fastnet. Since 2013, I joined Frisla Campina. That's a large cooperative and also multinational with a clear purpose, nourishing by nature, and also clear sustainability targets, which is very important for me. Um, they have targets for uh, farmers as well as for the company itself. I'm the director uh, group legal and uh, in that position I'm responsible also for M&A, financing and uh, the legal structure. And also for compliance with laws and regulations in relation to the listing of Vis Campina. Uh, the mission, goal and long term view of Fastnet really appealed to me. As an uh, EV driver myself for already quite a few years, I see many opportunities for Fastnet to grow, especially abroad. And I think with that also a lot of complexity uh, will come. And also stakeholder management and communication with the stakeholders and the investors, the holders of the posterior receipt, will become more and more important. With my experience and background, I will be honored to represent the holders of the posterior receipts of Fastnet and thereby safeguarding the long-term view of Fastnet. A majority of the depository receipt holders have voted and are in favor of the appointment of both Lise Lot and Maike. Therefore, I would like to welcome the both of you to the FAST Foundation Board. And I'm looking very much forward also together with Hank in working together uh, in the coming years. Thank you. Proposal on the amendment of the remuneration of the FAST Foundation Board for decision making by the depositary receipt holders by vote. Fastnet is a fast growing company with great ambition and plans. This acceleration and drive is also expected from the fast board members. The number and interest of depositary receipt holders has increased since this year, requiring even more dedication from the board. The role of the chair has proven to be and will be more intense than the role of the members. As a result, a larger amount of time is required, which in turn requires a different remuneration. Therefore, we have proposed to increase the remuneration of the members of the fast board in the following way. In 2020, the remuneration of all of the members was 5,000 euros. We have proposed to increase the remuneration to 15,000 euros for the chair and 10,000 euros for the members. A majority of the depositary receipt holders have voted in the past few weeks via the online platform and a majority of the votes were in favor of this new remuneration. Therefore, this increase will in take into effect as from June 3rd, 2021. After these final decisions, I will close this meeting and I hope we can meet in person next year at the annual meeting. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.